A very pleasant good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Captain Bob Guild, and along with the First Officer Paul Roshinsky, I'd like to welcome you aboard American Airlines Flight 77, nonstop service to Los Angeles International Airport. We're now level at our cruising altitude of 41,000 feet. I expect a relatively smooth ride today, so I'll turn the seatbelt sign off. Ding! I would recommend, however, that whenever you're in your seat, that you keep your seatbelt fastened about you just in case we encounter any unexpected bumpy weather. Well, our route of flight today to Los Angeles is going to take us just over Beckley, West Virginia. Then we'll go a little bit north of Memphis, a little north of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Albuquerque, New Mexico, then over Phoenix and into the Los Angeles area, yada, yada, yada. You do that for 25 years, and you can do it in your sleep. And uh, that I've, I've made that announcement on Flight 77 many times. Uh, Flight 77 ended up on September 11th in the Pentagon. Chick Burlingame, good friend of mine, was the captain on that flight. I had, uh, there were about 20 of us based out of Washington, D.C., who did the transcons, LA to, uh, to Dulles to LA and back. And um, I had Flight 75 Monday night. He had Flight 77 Tuesday morning. I had been begging him for the previous 10 days to do what we call a trip trade take his two-day trip, my two-day trip, and swap them. He said no, because he had tickets to the Angels game Tuesday evening. If he hadn't had tickets, he would have swapped, and I would have been the dead captain on Flight 77 in the Pentagon. I had flown with the flight attendants just four days prior, the ones who died there. How do we pass on what we felt that day? Those of us who were old enough on that day, I'll never forget, never forget, I was at the layover hotel in Long Beach because we had flown Monday night. And my first officer, Paul Roshinsky, I gave you, that was the announcement that I had made on Flight 77 many times, the one that I did at the beginning. And uh, right before six o'clock in the morning, my phone rang, I'm sound asleep, and it's Paul. He says, oh my God, turn your TV on. And thus began the day uh, that I'll never forget. Could you put up the next pictures, please? Okay, there are five pictures here. A friend of mine uh, who retired as a three-star admiral uh, was working at the Pentagon, and uh, so he sent me, uh, this is government cameras, so the date on the bottom left-hand side, they never get it right. Uh, but these are the pictures, there are five of them, and there we are, that's two, now three, four, Five. And now if you can go back, there we are. Now go to the very next picture. Uh, I had my 25th reunion at the Naval Academy 10 days after 9-11. One of my friends who was at the reunion, classmate, see where that flash is? He was on the fifth floor directly above the impact. They were in a two-year project of, of strengthening the Pentagon and they had only gotten one section finished where they had strengthened the walls of the Pentagon. That was the one section that Flight 77 hit. If it had not been strengthened, the damage would have been incalculably worse. That's exactly where it hit. My friend was right in the middle of it on the fifth floor. Uh, the 75 went through and took out the first, second, and third floors. He was getting ready for a morning brief. At the time, he was a Navy captain, so he's getting ready for a morning brief that he was giving. And uh, the next thing he knew, he was on the floor. He got up and he ran down the hallway, opened the stairs to get down, roaring flames, closed it, ran down to the next one, roaring flames. And he said all he could remember was that there's not that much fire in a truck bomb, because he was thinking truck bomb. And he finally got to the third one, no flames. He ran down, ran outside, looked to where his office was just in time to see it collapse. And he said that's when his whole body started shaking. 9-11 was an amazing experience. And could you put up the next? There's two more pictures. Uh, be, beyond the Pentagon pictures, there should be two more. There. Uh, and then uh, there's another one also. So that was, I flew the very first transcon back from LA back to Dulles 
where 77 had taken off from. And the fellow leaning out the window is Terry Thames. He was the captain on flight 77 on Monday. I was the captain on 75 Tuesday. You can see my head just, you know, in the captain's seat. I had scooched my seat forward. Um, and this is coming back to a different world. 9-11, uh, we still have the after effects today. Psalm 91, everyone noticed at the time that on 9-11, just move it one and you get 91-1. Psalm 91 verse one, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. He goes on to say, you will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day. And in verse 7, he says, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. How do you and I reconcile 9-11 with 91-1? How do we reconcile a good, a gracious, and all-powerful, a loving God with the reality that evil happens. Not just evil in the sense of 9-11 that just kind of leaps out at you, but the insidious day in and day out. How do we reconcile a God who loves us and says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, plans to give you a future and a hope. How do you reconcile that with one of my wife's friends who she works with, 36 years old? Three years ago, he and his wife gave birth a little prematurely to two beautiful twins, both of whom died within three months. And then last, uh, just earlier this year, she was pregnant again. And they went in and they did an ultrasound and they found a cancerous mass on her liver. She miscarried four weeks later and she died last week at age 35. And at the memorial service yesterday, he talked about the faithfulness of God. What? He lost his two children. He lost a possible, the third one to a miscarriage, and then he lost his wife. And you know what he said? He said, people ask, why is it so unfair? And he had them in tears. He said, here's the real question. Can you find God in tragedy? Can you find God in adversity? Will God walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death? Is Psalm 91 really real? Or are we just following some make-believe story? Because life is complicated. And so today, I, I've got another 14 minutes and three seconds, and I just want to challenge you and give just a couple of stories and examples. I would like to challenge each one of you to, to use your time here at Jessup wisely. You're no longer, uh, you know, you're out of high school, you're in college. This is a time for you to spread your wings to find out what do I really believe? What is God really like? How do I navigate through the, the, the challenges and the adversity of real life? How do I handle those kind of situations? Am I going to lose my faith because God didn't come through when I expected him to come through? The most important things you're going to do here at Jessup have nothing to do with which major you choose. They have nothing to do with which job you're going to end up with after you, you graduate from here. The most important things, the most important decisions you make here at Jessup have to do with your values, your worldview, how you see God, how God sees you, how you see your life, if I could, if I could uh, borrow from Pastor Francis Anfuso. 
Those are the most important things. And I ask you that during this time at Jessup to, to go to the hard places, talk with your friends, talk with your professors, talk with your mentors. You might think that, well, I'm, I'm at Jessup, it's a Christian, if, they, if, 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 if I go to my prof and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about this, they might think, well, you're losing your faith and I'm going to give you a lower grade. No, 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 no. Th what better place than here to ask the tough questions? Every generation must wrestle with the hard issues of life in a fresh way. And we stand on the shoulders of giants. We stand on the shoulders of men and women who have wrestled with those questions before. And we can read about how they wrestled with them and the conclusions they came to. But more than that, you need to sit down with your profs, with your friends, with your campus pastor, with the other folks here on staff, and if you have a tough issue that you're going through, don't hide it. Talk with them about it. There are no easy answers. I wish I could tell you, having experienced 9-11, having two sons who were in the Marines, one who was with recon in Iraq, one was a scout sniper in Afghanistan, and helping walk with them through what they saw and what they experienced in the hard way. They came to us, Dad, I don't get this. And I didn't have any pat answers for them. I don't want pat answers. I want something deep and real and authentic and life-changing. I need a worldview. I need a God who is bigger than what I face. I need a God who is really in control, especially when it seems like things are out of control. And man, you look around culture today and things seem to be out of control, don't they? Things seem to be, you know, the, we see people fighting one another over everything from vaccinations to race relations to the economy to you name it. And, and we see people just, well, now what about this and what about that and attacking one another. And I say that God has a better view of things. I say that there is a, a way to listen to one another, to seek the Lord together, where the things that unite us together are more powerful than the differences that we may have. And we're going to have differences. Can you just acknowledge that? We will have differences, sometimes in very important matters. We will have differences. But in the most important matters, we need to be of one heart. How do you see God? Four most important words in the Bible. In the beginning, God. Everything else proceeds from that. If your worldview begins and ends with your lived experience, it will not hold the weight of reality. Your lived experience is not enough to get you through life. In the beginning, Bob, that will not get me through the storms of life. In the beginning, God will. Because then I can take my lived experience to the Lord and we can sift through. What if my lived experience is wrong? It's my experience, but what if it, it, I have false uh, uh, um, uh, false outlook on something. So in the beginning, God, um, how do we respond to tragedy? How do we respond to adversity? Jesus said this in John chapter 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Okay, this is what Jesus said. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Paul says in Romans 12, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil 
with good. And just a couple of thoughts on evil. Someone might say, well, did God create evil? Well, let me back up just a minute. And let's talk about light and darkness. How many have ever gone to Home Depot to buy a light bulb? Or Lowe's or somewhere, you buy a light bulb, okay? How many have ever gone to Home Depot to buy a dark bulb? Is there any such thing as a dark bulb? When I go to a dark bulb and I screw it in up there and when I turn it on, all the light goes away. Ain't no such thing. Dark is the absence of light. You don't buy a dark bulb. Light conquers darkness. The only way darkness wins is if we put something between us and the light. How about heat and cold? What is cold? The absence of heat. Now, when you turn your air conditioner on and it pumps cold air out, how does it make the air cold? It goes through a heat exchanger because cold is the absence of heat. You can't get something, when you turn an oven on, you don't make it cold. Now, your refrigerator gets it cold, but how does it get it cold? By running the, stu- the, 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 the fluid through a heat exchanger. It extracts heat, and then the leftover cold goes into the fridge, and it makes things cold. What is evil but the absence of God? Jeremiah chapter 2, the Lord says, my people have committed two evils. The Hebrew word is ra. Now, New International Version it says, my people have committed two sins. But the word ra, which you find about 400 times in the Bible, is almost overwhelmingly always in, uh, uh, translated evil. Here they translated it sin. You go to the New King James or the King James, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the living water, and they have made for themselves broken cisterns which cannot hold water. Evil is the absence when we reject God and we turn our back on him and we say, no, in the beginning, Bob, the end result will be evil. Now, One final point, got five minutes to go, but uh, I'd like to go to a couple of stories, one personal and one in the Bible, and that is, can God walk with you through the hard times? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the book of Daniel, they were tasked with worshiping a false god, and they wouldn't do that. And you know the story. They got cast into the fire. And you know how Nebuchadnezzar looked in there and he said, how many people are in there? There are four, and one looks like the Son of Man. Now my question is this, was God with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before they were thrown in the fire? Sure was. Was he with them after they came out of the fire? He sure was. But he was with them in the fire in a way that was tangible and was equal to the fire. Uh, Years ago, I went through prisoner of war school in this, this 1978, so before most of you were even a gleam in your parents' eye. Uh, We had recently come out of Vietnam, and they were sending all pilots, special warfare, and air crew through a two-week prisoner of war camp. And uh, it was in glorious Warner Hot Springs in the high desert of Southern California. Spent a week in the classroom and then a week where you got captured and you're a prisoner. Best school I ever went to. The toughest school I ever went to. I would never want to do it again. But what they did is they, got, they, they wanted you to experience what the first several days are like when you're captured and uh, you're behind enemy lines and you're a prisoner of war. Well, on what ended up being the last day, they, we were, the camp disciplinarian was there, and we were cleaning up all the rocks and the stones from the high desert. And all you have to do is this, and more rocks come up. And so the, all of the, the camp disciplinarians were yelling at us, it's hot, we've been there for a while, it's been hard. Uh, they had found out on one of the earlier days that I was a Christian because, see, this is not a Christian, this is a Navy school. So it's not like we're going to teach you biblical principles. They had found out that I, I wanted the Bible. They asked me what kind of book I wanted. I said, I like the Bible. 
And so they, they in their interrogation of me, uh, found out that I was a Christian. So th- they filed it away and decided that they were going to run what they, they called the preacher scenario. And, and they did this once a quarter, the class. And so they would run different scenarios based on who they had. And so they ran the preacher scenario. And so they were yelling at us and they, they finally said, well, we're going to let you have religious, we're going to let you have services. Will the religious representative please come forward? And we're all looking at each other like, we don't, we don't have a religious representative. So they yelled out, war criminal number three, five, which was my war criminal number. And so they're all looking at me like, I don't know. So I ran up to the camp disciplinarian and you have, you have to hold the side and you have to do a bow and you can't get up until they let you or else you pay the price. And so he threw a Bible on the ground in front of me and he said so that only I could hear, you have five minutes, pig. And in the moment, God gave me a scripture out of Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus emptying himself and about the reality that God's love is more powerful than any evil, that the strongest force, the strongest personal power in all of history was the love of God in Jesus Christ. So I'm preaching this, and it's one of those, wow, God, you rock, and I'm getting into it, and he had given me five minutes, and I'm just preaching up and down. I mean, these, you know, I don't know how many Christians there were. This is just a bunch of uh, 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 Navy dudes. And uh, so about halfway into it, the guy comes, knocks me over, yanks the Bible out of my hand, and he starts ripping the pages out, frothing at the mouth, throwing it down. And then finally, when he threw the last down, he yells out, I mean, we're all in shock, and he goes, if your God be alive, let him strike me dead. And all the guys like took a step back because they didn't want to get struck also. And then they put me on trial, and they found me guilty of preaching, and they sentenced me to death. Then they took me off to the side, having sentenced me in front of all of the, 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 uh, my fellow prisoners, took me off to the side, and the camp disciplinarian takes a gun and puts it to my head. And he gives me the opportunity to take back what I preached. Now, I knew he wasn't going to kill me. It's a Navy school, and what good is the school when you're dead? Plus, my wife would be really upset. But... <laughs> In that moment, God's presence was as powerful, and I've gone, oh, three seconds to go, was as powerful as I have ever experienced. Because God is with you in the fire in a way that matches the intensity of the fire. And that was an intense moment. And in that moment, I sensed the presence of God that he took all of that for me. He went through all of what I had gone through and much more. And I also realized that there were men and women in the world in that moment and today in Afghanistan, today in Iran, today in Syria, today in Niger, There are people who they're getting the gun or the knife to the throat, and it's not a Navy school. It's the real deal. And I'm here to tell you that God is with them in a way that matches the intensity of the fire. Don't waste your time here at Jessup. Dive into the hard things. Talk with your friends, with your professors, with your mentors because I'm here to tell you that God can more than match the hard questions.